I wish I had known when I was growing up as a cross-dressing teenager. And I wish I had known that Joan of Arc was a teenage, illiterate peasant transvestite who led an army of peasants who thought that she was sacred, who was so brilliant and so courageous, you know, that she, like, liberated territory from this powerful army. And then that she was so powerful from the point of view of her own class, you know, that she was so threatening as a peasant leader at a time of tremendous peasant upheaval that her, the, the very king and his class that she aided turned on her. And why did they execute her? Why did they even try her? There were all these charges, but they boiled them down to about 12 and several of them centered on her transvestism. There is not a single constitutional protection for someone who's transgendered. Now that could sound like I'm talking about legislature. I'm not. It's like I have no rights. There's a history of transgendered people being told to either strip or be forcibly stripped. That your body can be examined by any cop, any prison guard, any institutional attendant, etc., any gang on the street. And so I had to weigh two things in deciding to do this shoot. One is that the question of how I view my body as a transgendered woman is very, very important to discuss. And the other is that it be conducted somehow from a place of dignity and strength. And that's why I chose the gym. I don't really see myself when I look in the mirror. I see parts of myself sometimes. But I really think that for myself, when I look in the mirror, I see a combination of the way I see me and I see the way the world sees me. And I'm always fighting to define my own reflection. I really come here to work out a lot of problems about how I look at my body and how I feel in it. And a lot of, I sort of sweat out the attitudes the world imposes on me about my body. I don't, I can't really say why other people come here. I'm sure some people come to exercise their bodies. But in a lot of ways, I kind of come here to exorcise demons and to kind of get rid of what gets built up in sort of grimy layers all day long. So when did you first notice that I was transgendered? <laughs> That's a great question <laughs> because when I first met you in Winnipeg, we had been driving for like you know, three days. And a crazed and moose tried to assassinate you. <laughs> you were the first man I saw. <laughs> <laughs> and I was casing you out as uh -huh. we were driving up the driveway. Move, 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 move. I'm riding, I'm sliding, I won't. I can't imagine that any video that was dealing with the issue of gender boundaries, gender would not have the obligatory tie scene. But the most interesting aspect of it to me is how little it has to do with my transgender. Because, you know, when people talk about cross-dressing, what I don't like about the word is it sounds like if I took off this tie and this white shirt, I would no longer be transgender. Woo, woo, woo. shopping my salesperson is Ramon what does he think I am 
Absolutely, he thinks I'm male. Does he think I'm gay? I guess. Do I think he's gay? Probably. Because I pass to a degree as male, I can go in and buy a suit. But it's risky. It's dangerous. You've got to have the chutzpah or the ovaries or the testicles or the something to be able to go into a men's store um, if you're not a traditional man in order to buy a suit. Um, because I do have whatever of the above that are necessary to do that, I love it. Don't get strung up by the way I look. Don't judge a book by its cover. I'm not much of a man by the light of day, but by night I'm one hell of a lover. When I first went to see the Rocky Horror Show, it was a cult audience, and it was a transgendered person that they were focusing that attention on. I'm glad we caught you at home. Could we use your phone? Rocky Horror Picture Show was playing for years and years on 8th Street, and I had trouble walking down the street because there are traditionally gangs of bashers on 8th Street. Well, you got caught with a flat world. How about that? Well, babies. Rocky Horror Picture Show, being on 8th Street didn't liberate 8th Street. You know, we got to do that. I don't see myself or any of the transgender people I know represented in, in movies. I mean, what do you see? You see things like the first real example of the genre of of transgendered people as crazed serial killers was psycho. And then the continuations were like Dress to Kill and Silence of the Lambs. When we walk down the street, people aren't threatened by me. They threaten me. I mean, you refer to it as the wave reaction. We walk down the street and heads just turn in waves. I guess they're and they're correct. trying to figure out something about us that they cannot figure out. I wondered if you'd see uh, any of the double takes that we get or that she gets as we were walking along the promenade here. Unless we said, oh, Probably not here. People are fascinated by the view, and it's kind of anonymous. And then I saw two people. It's just transparent, the look that comes over their face. You know, they look, and they sort of look at me, and they look back at you, and they look at me again, and they kind of look puzzled. And, and they won't look away. It's very interesting. I have this game now where I try and make them stop looking. I know. You can't shame I can't, people out I of can't. it. I can't. They uh... won't stop looking. There's some things that you have a right to stare at. You know, I just stare back at them and stare back at them. They won't stop looking. No. It was as it's if sort of like we... being at a zoo when Yeah, the and the animals are looking, are looking back. Yeah. And it's like, well, who cares if they're looking back? They're not, they're not real. They're not human. They're subject to our gaze. But also, the way transgender people have been portrayed, it's really, um, it makes it harder to walk the streets. Well, and just the rigidity of the gender system makes it harder to walk the street. Yeah. You know, but, anybody who's perceived as breaking of out of that. Yeah. The social penalties. Mm -hmm. And some of those social penalties have been carried out right across this river on the Hudson Piers. Mm -hmm. You know, the piers are like, I love the piers, they're, they're ours in a way. I mean, we've always liberated them at night and on a hot summer night, in, I just, I love the piers. But, you know, when I look at the Hudson here, it's like, it's like a watery grave. Um, I don't know how many, how many transgender people have been raped or murdered on these piers, but I know that we all live under the threat of it. Why come to the piers if they're so dangerous? Well, 
why come to the piers if they're dangerous? It's dangerous everywhere. It's not like the piers are dangerous and, um, you know, 8th Street isn't. 8th Street is full of bashers, especially on a Friday or Saturday night. But we got to go somewhere. And I think, I don't think the piers are dangerous and we go there. I think where we go becomes dangerous, you know? Where people know they can go to find us is dangerous, but that's where we go to find each other. So, you know when they say there's safety in numbers? Well, there's a truth to that. But um, until we're organized as a community, we're sort of a bigger group of people to bash. Life expectancy is the issue. What the Brandon Tina case shows is just the tip of the iceberg of the kind of violence, the kind of rampant violence that we face as transgendered people every day. Brandon Tina uh, left Lincoln, Nebraska and moved to Humboldt, Nebraska in about November of last year, a town of a little more than a thousand, and was very accepted as a man in the town, um, dated, was looking for work, etc. The authorities forcibly outed Brandon Tina and revealed that he had been born Tina Brandon and told people not only that he was female at birth but printed his birth name in the newspaper in this small town. A couple of weeks later Brandon Tina at a Christmas party was forcibly stripped by two men, was then beaten up, kidnapped and raped by the two men and then a very short time later, on New Year's Eve day, I believe, Brandon Tina and two other people were found, their bodies riddled with bullets in a farmhouse, shot to death by these same two men. We know that the kind of violence that's, that we're subject to is being instigated. The green lights are from above. It comes from the White House, through the courts, to the cops, to the media. And that violence has got to stop. Evidence of that is the murder of Marsha Johnson, a Stonewall combatant in 1969, who was found floating in the Hudson River last year after gay pride. And although there were signs of violence, the police wrote it off as a suicide after an investigation that consisted of two phone calls. I found out, just within like the last 10 or 15 years, that there's always been people like me. I, I remember exactly the day it was, too. I, I was in um, a museum. I think it was a Museum of the American Indian on 155th and Amsterdam. And I saw this whole case of these little sort of thumb-sized thumb pottery men and women. And it was perfect, you know, all the women had little clay breasts and little tattoos and stuff. And then there were sort of little figures with different kind of tattoos and bows. Now, this sounds very simplistic about the basket and the bow, and I really don't mean it very simply at all. But. So I was looking at them, and I noticed that a couple of the little clay women didn't have breasts, and a couple of the little clay men did and I couldn't figure it out. And I kept standing there staring at that case for a long time thinking about it. And finally I called the curator of the museum. And he actually asked me, why do you want to know? I, I, why do you want to know? Like, like the information can only be given out on a need to know basis, you know? So I said, well, I'm a student at Columbia because I didn't, I wanted the information and I was afraid I would, it would become inaccessible to me if I said, because I'm one of those little clay dolls without breasts, you know, with a bow, what can I tell you? So he said, well, yes, it's quite amazing, isn't it, about the burdash? I had never really thought about the word before. And he said, he said, I come across it every day in my reading. His own tone got kind of scared, you know. He sort of dropped down. He, he dropped his, his face and he said, it's really very disturbing, isn't it? And I, I was just so mad. I 
was so mad. And that's how I felt when I found out about Joan of Arc. What if I had known all that when I was growing? You know? I mean, what, what kind of possibilities that would have opened up for me to find my place in the world, to find my place in history? There's a reason why I didn't know all that stuff. It's not just that they didn't tell me. They didn't want me to know it, and I needed to know it. But I found it anyway. There's an old African saying that until the lions come to power, the hunters will write the history. So this is the lions taking back their own history. Vibrating top here. So, uh, if you and I did it together, would we be straight? I don't think so. We'd be confused, but we'd, <laughs> we'd be happy. <laughs> so, Debbie, I, was, I went to the city. I went into Manhattan, and I was going to go. We was walking through the village, and I got some cool earrings. Look, look. And I, oh, they're fabulous. Thanks. So, I was looking for the Hard Rock Cafe. And someone told me it wasn't in the village, and I thought, isn't everything in the village that's cool? So we were walking, and I saw this place that everyone was going into. I thought it was cool. It was called the Period or something. The first time I came to the Pyramid Club, I was right here in this dressing room, and I can't even tell you if you could imagine, like, the entire cast of La Cage aux Faux in here, you know, uh, needing space in the mirror and, and getting dressed and, and helping each other get dressed. And, and I sat there in the corner, uh, in my little shirt and tie, just so happy to be in a room full of my sisters. And there was this really weird girl on the stage, and she was so weird, and her hair was this big. But mine's this big, but only in the front. It was this big. When I first came out before Stonewall, oh god, it was more than a quarter of a century ago. It's a startling admission. In those days, the pre-Stonewall bars were predominantly filled with differently gendered lesbians and gay men. Now, let me explain when I say differently gendered, cross-gendered, transgender, all of this implies two polar opposites. We could only be considered gender bent in a society that's gender rigid. And then, but then after that, this really cute guy came on the stage. He was really cute, and he, he was wearing white jacket and stuff like that. And yeah. And then the girl came back on stage, and someone said she was dragged here from Queens or something. I didn't catch it. Our gender expression showed. So there were no closets big enough to hide in. There were no bushel baskets big enough to hide under. And so we were visible in society. We were the visible tip of an iceberg, and no one had ever historically seen the whole iceberg. And so, of course, people thought that being transgendered meant you were gay, because you know, there we were. And we thought it, too. The gender community is really predominantly heterosexual and bisexual or asexual included. Not everybody who's differently gendered is gay. See, this is very simple to me. Here's the lesbian gay population. Not everybody in it is transgendered. Here's the gender community. Not everybody in it is gay. They're partially overlapping populations. And I'm in this part that overlaps. That's me right there. I'm gay and transgendered. And it's like having a foot in one of each of two rowboats. I have a serious personal interest in not seeing them go in opposite directions. Are butches butches because they love femmes or because there's something about our gender expression? It would seem to be just sort of a moot point, like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, which came first, the butchness or the lesbianism, except that there's another one of these great misunderstandings. If you simply identify that butch and femme go together like love and marriage and horse and carriage, soup and sandwich, 
then it leaves out butches who are attracted to other butches. It leaves out femmes who want to be with other femmes. It leaves out bisexual butches. It leaves no area at all to define why some women are so masculine and yet are heterosexual. To me, being butch doesn't mean what you do in bed. I mean, to be butch on the street, that's what being butch is to me. When a group of bashers on the street says, there goes one of them now, that is a social definition of what butch is. And if you can survive that on the streets, you have the right to go home and do anything in any combination in bed that you want without being ashamed of yourself. guest today was born a woman and still is a woman, though she chooses to pass as a man. She's the author of a semi-autobiographical novel called Stone Butch Blues, which I read last weekend. Please welcome Leslie Feinberg. Thank you. I don't want to have to go on the Joan River show and explain how I grew up and, and who I am and what I am and how I see myself and did I like boys or did I like girls. You know, I don't want to have to do that. But I have to, because I'm willing to be public and visible about it. Not any language that I've chosen myself. Right. I've been referred to as a butch, as a digital dyke, a he, she, uh, a, a female to male transvestite, um, a drag king. A drag king? Oh, I never heard that. But All you've right. heard drag queen. Yeah, of it's course. It's a simple flip. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we haven't had language that denotes pride for ourselves. Right. And the word transgender is really the first word that as a community we've chosen. Okay. So I would refer to myself as transgendered. We're sitting here with uh, Leslie. I, if I hear one more goddamn expert in my life. Is that okay? <laughs> Ooh. Right, you know, I'm so right. sick of being psychologized. I'm so sick of being studied like a, a butterfly pinned to a wall, you know. I mean, it's not... I'm not in a position to judge and say, you know, this person should do this thing or that thing. What I try to do is... For all our lives, we've it. always heard, seen ourselves refracted through other people's prisms. No. Right. We've always heard people analyze us, describe what our feelings are, what our thoughts are. How about talking about why Jesse Helms needs some therapy? Yeah. You know? <laughs> or, or what, what on earth is going through the minds of those Klansmen, you know? Yes, yes. We, and so if, if we're going to talk about our situations, because if you don't name an oppression, you can't fight it. Right. You know, basically, you can't organize around it, is that we want our own voices to be yes, heard. That's and right. that's what the Civil Rights Movement did. That's what the Women's Movement and did. And in a little way, the that's what the Joan Rivers that's show exactly is done today. no time for people who try to liquidate the oppression. You know, there are people who will say, well, Tallulah Bankhead has a low voice. Well, lots of lesbians have short hair. Well, when I grew up, I grew up like a boy, you know. I don't want to hear it. I really don't. Those of us who are going through it all the time don't really need to hear other people say, I go through the same thing as you do, and really when I think about it, it's no big deal, so it really doesn't exist. How do you think you'd feel? How would you feel if every time you went to the bathroom, every door that got shut, every petty insult became like a storm to walk through? Every day of my life is a struggle. But living that way woke me up. It made me have to think about other people's oppression. It made me have to look at how we're being pitted against each other every day to keep us from getting together and winning some real change. It's made me live every day as though my hair is on fire. I didn't know two and a half years ago when we started this video if I would even live to see the end of it, the way Venus Extravaganza didn't live to see the end of Paris' burning. Every single day of my life is a fight. But this is a fight that's worth it to me. This is what my life is about.